Okay, let's survive together to uh, coffee break. So uh, Tom, I'm Tomek, software engineering manager at a Swedish company called Secure. We are a fintech company doing our own mobile payments with office in Wuch, where there is whole software engineering department, ops department, and product management. So apart from that, I'm a trainer, coach, consultant at Sages. You can reach me at uh, Tomek at work uh, Twitter handle. So feel free to, to tweet if you want. Let's go. Um, short movie. Um, obviously, to, to win a race, we need a fast and reliable car and a great driver. But uh, usually, there is an uh, engineering team behind and services team behind. Uh, and if those teams, they work separately, uh, the engineering team will try to create the car as fast as possible, right? On the other hand, the, the services team, what they'll try to do, they will take the car and try to master uh, or, or be as fast as possible in terms of refueling the car and changing the tires, right? And uh, Edwards Deming was already quoted today. He said that local optimizations, they produce suboptimal global solutions. So what would happen if actually those two teams had the very same goal? First of all, um, most probably they will start communicating better between each other and maybe they would realize that they have the very same goal, which is winning the race, right? Uh, does the same reasoning apply to products which heavily rely on software? I would say that yes. Uh, because it's not only the reliable product you have, and uh, if, can, if it's reliable and and relevant, but also if we can deliver it to production fast, right? And this is what DevOps is all about. It's about taking the technological advancement connected with automated infrastructure, uh, automated testing, and continuous deployment, and being able to deliver value to your customers rapidly. Okay? And it has something to do with culture, which I'll tell, tell you later on. In the past decades, uh, according to research, there were three main change initiatives happening in the companies. The first one was trying to implement uh, total quality management. The second one was trying to implement or re-engineer processes. And uh, the third one was downsizing. All of them were aimed at increasing effectiveness of a company. And the research sh shows that the failure rate of introducing such a change is as high as 75%. And when the CEOs were asked, what is the reason, or what was the main reason, I mean in retrospect, what was the main reason for failure, they said that they didn't take into account organizational culture when doing the change. So neglecting organizational culture in transformation actually may result in getting back to, to square one or to status quo pretty fast. And why I would like to talk about this and talk about culture, because from my perspective, DevOps transformation is not only implementing continuous integration or continuous delivery, but usually it means breaking the silos so the change is deep enough in your organization that culture has something to, to do with this. And as, as Grzegorz says today, uh, if this is a strategic initiative to implement DevOps in your organization, then culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if you don't take into account the culture, then maybe you may fail or risks are high that you will fail. So let's try to define and measure the culture, okay? So uh, meet Hugh. He was a great coordinator and organizer, and he believes that efficiency comes from processes, that everything is stable in the company. This is the source of effectiveness. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, Claire. She's a great mentor and team builder, and she thinks that human development is it's a predicting factor of the success of a company. On the other hand, there may be Adyen. She's a visionary and entrepreneur. And she says that agility, taking risk, experimenting is the way to succeed as a company. And on the other hand, there's Mark. He's a hard driver. And he says that aggressive competition is a way to be number one in the market. And all those four people they represent four different cultures. 
Uh, one is hierarchy culture or hierarchical culture, clan culture, autocratic, and market. And depending where you put the, the axis or the division line, they have something in common. So the upper ones, they generally represent flexibility. So what Adienne would do, she would ask the, herself, okay, are we agile enough to adapt to ever-changing market? To be able to pivot fast when we learn something new about our customers. On the other hand, the, the lower cultures, they praise stability. So for instance, what Hugh would say, that any disobedience of processes in their company is a source of risk, which may lead to failure. This is how he would most probably think. The, uh, the cultures on the left-hand side, on the other hand, they represent internal focus. So what uh, Claire would do, she would uh, analyze how good the team is and what are the relationships inside the team, which is a prediction of how well a given company uh, will succeed. And there's also external focus for the cultures on the right-hand side. Uh, Mark, most probably, he would ask himself a question. Okay, are we number one on the market? Do we have the biggest I know, return on investment on the market? And the key thing is that these kind of cultures, the four ones, uh, they coexist in a company usually. And there's a natural friction between teams or departments possessing different kind of cultures. For instance, market culture is typical for sales departments. Uh, hierarchy culture, typical for, uh, I don't know, governance, uh, governance or security departments inside the company, ad hocratic, maybe it's a kind of R&D, right? So how to measure this? So there is a survey invented by Cameron and McQueen. Uh, you ask your employees questions, six questions, about the dimensions of your company. The first one is, uh, what is the dominant characteristic in your company? Is it like an extended family? Or uh, is it like an entrepreneurial price? Or maybe this is a very results-oriented price? Or maybe highly structured? And people are asked to distribute 100 points among the answers, just to show how they perceive the culture. So they fill in the now column. And they're also asked to show, okay, what should be the ideal culture in the company for it to be successful? And then they fill in the preferred culture. Obviously, answer A stands for clan culture, B for autocratic, C for market, and D for hierarchy. Uh, next question is about organizational leadership. So is our leaders in your company kind of a mentor, or maybe entrepreneur, or hard driver, or organizer, or, or coordinator? The remaining, uh, the remaining uh, four dimensions is uh, management of employees. What is the organizational glue in your company? Uh, what are the strategic emphasis in your company? And what are the criteria of success? And if you sum the answers for A, B, C, and D and average them, you're able to produce a plot of your culture in your company. So for instance, in an example, a given company has a, is a mix of hierarchical and market culture. How, this is how people perceive the culture now. But they say that the preferred culture should be a mix of mostly autocratic culture and a pinch of clan hierarchy and market. Okay? So let's, uh, let me show you what we did in our company. We interviewed uh, all employees in our Polish office. Um, and the key thing is to understand that this is not about finding the truth, but about understanding perspective of different people in the company. So a uh, uh, description of our company, it looks like this, that we have site reliability engineering team, which is uh, responsible for provisioning of environments, stability of environments, network connectivity, and such. And there is software engineering team consisting of cross-functional teams, which in turn consists of QA engineers, sysadmins, and, and uh, developers. Anyway, getting back to the software reli site reliability engineering team, the people said in the team that this is how they perceive the culture. So mostly clan with a bit of autocracy uh, and market. Whereas the leader, he perceives culture differently, which looks like this. And uh, as I said, it's not about finding the truth or who is right or wrong. But what you can learn from this, uh, from this plot is that uh, you shouldn't expect innovation coming out of the site reliability engineering team, which is typical for autocratic culture. 
the leader is mostly focused on providing stable environments. So if you plan to do an innovation, maybe you shouldn't start with that team, which is no accusation, just describing or, or looking how it's understanding what are the good, what are the strong parts of the company in a given areas. Let's move to a software engineering team. As I said, there's, these are the teams consisting of QA engineers, uh, sysadmins and, and developers. There's a de de dedicated role of scrum master slash agile coach and there, there's a management of a team. So uh, the, good, the good thing is that people are satisfied with the culture they have. As you can see, the red and blue polygon are more or less the same. So that's a good thing. <laughs> scrum masters, they perceive situation more or less the same. However, there's a problem with managers because they see that there's a need for a change. And the reason for that is we are a fintech company. We try to disrupt the payment market and uh, we strongly believe that software engineers shouldn't be software engineers as such. We try to think about people being product developers, expert at software engineering or expert at quality assurance or expert at sysadmin. And this is shown by this shift towards market culture uh, in the preferred culture from the manager's perspective. Uh, this, is, this is the ex exemplification of, of, of this kind of thinking. And uh, obviously there is a need for change, at least for managers. Uh, and how to perform a change if the team is satisfied with the culture they have, right? So uh, what culture supports DevOps then? Uh, how many of you know Kinevin? Okay, this is a very popular word in the agile world. So let me give you a short explanation. This is a decision, uh, decision framework invented by, uh, by Dave Snowden, which helps you categorize problems you are at in four different areas. The first one is obvious. So there is a clear uh, cause and effect uh, relation. Like for instance, if you give pizza and coffee to developers, you would get a pretty decent code and sarcasm as a side effect, right? This is a cause and effect. Uh, of course, this is a joke and this is a stereotype. Uh, but anyway, this is an area of, of best practice, which is known, obvious to everyone. What you just do, you just sense the, sense the problem, okay? You say it's obvious, you just categorize it. We should do, do this and that and just respond. A bit more complicated uh, area or domain is complicated where the cause and effect relation is uh, known after analysis. So if you, if you perceive reality or, or the problem you're at as, as a complicated, what most probably what you should do is to gather experts, let them sense the situation, analyze and think about the response. There is also complex domain, which is a bit tricky because usually cause and effect are known in retrospect. So once things happened, then you know why it happened. And the way to, to deal with such a reality is first of all, you try to try experiment, observe the results, uh, and then respond by either amplifying your actions or, or trying another action. And there is of course chaos, which is like there's no uh, cause and effect, it's unknown and you just should start doing anything you think it's reasonable, uh, see the results and then respond. And uh, according to my, my experience, at least from our company and when advising other companies, usually when dealing with continuous delivery, first of all, I haven't seen two companies with the very same delivery, continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, moreover, I've seen companies, including ours, who spends lots of time or spent a lot of time on discussions. Everyone was right, but there was no easy solution. Which tells me that perhaps we are not in the complicated domain, but maybe in the complex domain. And uh, usually when dealing with continuous delivery, taking into account all the complexity, the context of the company and so on, according to my experience, the complex domain, which requires lots of experimenting. And to give you an example, uh, 
A couple of months ago, we released host card emulation, so you can pay with your mobile just by putting it next to a, to a terminal, and it emulates a card, contactless card. Uh, and we are wondering how we should test it. We want it to be to know before our customers learn it that something doesn't work. So continuous monitoring on production. Not wait till customer calls you and says, hey, we, we got a problem, I cannot pay with your solution at the shop. We want to learn about the fact earlier than the others. And there is like five companies involved behind that. We are, of course, the front end to a, to a customer. So we had a, we could either have lots of discussions thinking how to do it, or just try one approach and see if it works. And one of the approaches, just to show you, one of the guys, he constructed a robot which is uh, connected with Bamboo and uh, Appium, if you know Appium, for automated uh, tests. And we are just trying to monitor something which happens exactly from customer perspective. So just putting the, the mobile phone with our app next to a terminal, right? And apparently it worked. Uh, and uh, there, were other, there were other solutions on the table like let's mock all the external systems and so on, but this is not what customers see. We wanted to simplify the domain we had and just did it like that. And it worked. And I wouldn't say that this is the perfect solution for you because you got to understand your context and do it on your own. So let's move on. As I said, DevOps is uh, tightly connected with continuous delivery model and there is a maturity model for different areas like design architecture, build and deploy, test verification, information reporting. And what I learned that the first three to, to move forward, you have to experiment a lot. And if, and if there's lots of experimentation, this means autocratic culture or a need of autocratic culture in your company. As far as information reporting is concerned, this is about curiosity about your customers. Like Facebook, they are able to measure that uh, a given feature, when it's deployed in production, it can bring them that much money or they lost a given amount of money or earned a given amount of money. And this is about this curiosity about, about customer, about market and so on, which is typical for market culture. Okay. So if we are dealing with complex adaptive systems, uh, I don't know, Jess Humble, most probably know him, Dave Snowden, they say that it is the small decentralized teams which should deal with, with, uh, with complex adaptive systems. What does this mean? It means that the teams should be small enough and independent of other teams to be able to make decisions fast and effectively. Small decentralized teams, they need alignment. For instance, CEO of Netflix, he says that their goal is to have uh, highly aligned but loosely coupled teams. Alignment, to, reach, to, to achieve alignment, you need autonomy. And the thing about autonomy is that the teams need to be empowered. As far as power is concerned in an organization, usually the amount of power is constant in the organization, which means that leaders need to disempower themselves in favor of teams. And if there are any leaders on, uh, here with us, I would like to ask you a question. Are you able to, or are you willing to disempower yourself in favor of a team? This is quite a challenge for a leader, I guess. And also the key thing about autonomy is that clan culture supports autonomy. Because if there is a clan culture, the teams feels confident enough to make decisions on their own and uh, take responsibility for that and understand consequences of that. So uh, what is the culture profile we arrived at in our company? So it looks like this. So it's a mix of clan, autocracy, and market culture, where clan culture stands for autonomy of teams or supports autonomy of teams. Autocracy culture uh, helps solving complex problems with delivery pipeline. And market culture is about curiosity, curiosity about customers, market competition, and understanding that what we are doing is not just writing a piece of code, but writing, creating something which brings value to, to end customers. And of course, some sensible processes are needed always in the company. And the key thing about this plot is that you shouldn't copy it in your organization. Because you should understand, if, 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 you, if you go deep into the Kinefin framework, you should understand that context is the key. 
So we should understand context of your company, uh, the market it operates on, how it looks, what is the structure of the company, what is the history and so on. Uh, and then choose the direction into which we'd like to change your culture. Because as Dave Snowden, so creator of Kinefin Framework says, culture change is, is an evolutionary process from the present and not perfect future state design. The reason for that is because it's a complex adaptive system. So you're gonna learn in your journey new things which you cannot even guess from square one. So if you focus too much on the perfect state, most probably you're gonna lose everything what happens in between. That's why it's so important to more focus on the direction than on the, on the, on the perfect state, which most probably you won't achieve. So how to influence culture? Uh, first of all, it's naive to think that leaders can change culture. The only thing they can do, they can influence it. Because culture is a sum of behaviors of all people in the company. Of course, leaders have some influence, but they cannot change it on their own. That's my, that's my uh, experience at least. So, uh, with every change, there is a survival anxiety connect, uh, connected, which usually uh, comes from feeling of helplessness. That's okay, I, I, I won't be able to do it. On the other hand, there is learning anxiety connected with a change, which is, uh, uh, will I be able to learn new things? Will I look funny when trying to, to change my behavior? And according to Edward Schein, one of the experts in, uh, in organizational culture, the relationship between survival anxiety and learning anxiety when doing a change should look like this. So if the fear of learning new things is smaller than fear of survival, then there is, uh, there is room for a change to happen. And uh, you can play with this inequality two ways. Unfortunately, I see lots of managers playing with survival anxiety by increasing it. So what they do, they threaten people that they will be fired or they will, uh, uh, they offer them bonuses for some extra work or some significant work, which means that they play with extrinsic motivators. And if you've read uh, a book by a Pink about motivation, uh, most probably will agree that external extrinsic motivators, they don't work as effectively as intrinsic motivators which are represented by learning anxiety. So instead of increasing uh, survival anxiety, what leaders in an organization can do, they can decrease learning anxiety for the inequality to hold. How to decrease learning anxiety? By creating safe to fail environment in your organization. So people should, be, should feel safe to experiment, uh, maybe up a scale which is survival, survivable for the company, so what changes can happen. Another, another, uh, another thing in terms of influencing organizational culture is to play with, with natural constraints by either relaxing them or increasing them. The way DevOps started in our uh, company was that we just had not enough sysadmins uh, in the old ops team, which were not able, or several teams were not able to, to, to have their work deployed on production by the, the old ops team. So they were told, guys, you need to do it on your own. And this is how DevOps started in our organization because there was a natural constraint. If you play with artificial constraints, what usually happens is that there is a uh, informal culture of bypassing artificial constraints. It, 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 uh, it starts in a company. As an example, I don't know what's your experience with IT processes and old good project management offices but usually they create processes in an organization, uniform for the whole organization, which are usually in artificial constraint. And what people do, they of course satisfy all the documents which needs to be filled in and so on, but the real process looks completely different. And this is a way of bypassing artificial constraints. Uh, managing connections and interactions. If you listen to stories in your company and decode those stories, you will see patterns of coping with, with, with problems and opportunities in organizations. And uh, what we, for instance, do is uh, when there's a socialization of new employees, so the first three months of new employee in our company, 
we try to mix those new people with people who are holders of culture we'd like to have uh, globally in our company. And those new people, they start to learn patterns of coping with threats and, and uh, opportunities from people who, who are holders of the culture we'd like to have. That's an example. Uh, as I mentioned, we, are, uh, we, we, we would like to disrupt the market, uh, the payments market. And we uh, try to identify weak signals on the market to change direction fast as a company. So why shouldn't we apply the same strategy when dealing with culture? So identifying weak signals uh, to amplify desirable culture pockets in a company. And to give an example, uh, we asked teams, development teams, to monitor production environment, I mean the application on production environment. And the teams reacted two ways. Uh, one of the teams said, okay, we can do it, but you, dear manager, needs to point the person who will who will be on duty and do the and do the monitoring given day. The other team said, "Okay, we can do it. We volunteer, but we will figure out internally how we're gonna how we're gonna provide the monitoring." And this is a tiny difference. One team asks for a typically hierarchical culture. We need a coordinator who will distribute. Okay, you will you will be on duty today. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow you will be the other person. This is asking for hierarchical culture. Whereas there was a team which said, okay, we volunteer, and we just, we can make it on our own. This is a typical clan culture behavior. And what management can do, management can reinforce certain behaviors or support certain behaviors in a company. And this is these minor actions which help you move culture change in a given direction. Another example, a team had a spare capacity in a sprint, so they said, okay, we're gonna fix bugs but they needed a product owner to, uh, to prioritize the bugs for them. Whereas the other team member said, hey guys, look, we can prioritize bugs on our own. Let's just think about what has the biggest impact on our customer. And this is an, a signal of market culture originating in team, which should be reinforced by the management. So let's get back to our DevOps transformation. If, if a company thinks, uh, thinks about DevOps transformation, I think it should also start with what is the culture, what is the culture it has. My experience shows because there's a lots of experimenting needs to take place, but for sure there needs to be a component of, of ad hoc rapid culture in a company for, for experimenting with continuous delivery at least. And if you start for instance from a clan culture, the change which needs to happen in your organization is from the internal focus to external focus. If you start your journey from a market culture, then what you need to do is to stop thinking about how stable situation your company is and think about how agile you can be or elastic you can be to change uh, to an environment which is constantly changing around you. The bad news is for hierarchical cultures, I would say that the risk is high that they won't make it. Because leaders in the hierarchical cultures, they are coordinators and organizers. And suddenly, for a successful DevOps transformation to happen, they need to become visionaries and entrepreneurs, people who are able to take risks. People who are able to create safety fail environment and not follow procedures and processes. And uh, I would say that the risk, the highest risk is for hierarchical cultures for a successful DevOps transformation. So what are the key takeaways from my, from my talk? First of all, when planning any change, significant change in organization, try taking organizational culture uh, into account. Second of all, understand context of your company to plan the change in a given direction. And for more details, please, please check Kinefin framework. Define direction of change of culture if needed, because maybe you are lucky, you don't need to change a culture or influence a change of a culture. And remember that it's people who do the actual work and culture is only a fundament which either amplifies, amplifies your effort or, uh, or just makes it fail. And uh, basically that's it. Thanks for your <laughs>